My name is April Wepler, and I am the Engagement Coordinator for the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. And I'm joining the call today from Guelph. My home is on the banks of the Speed River, which is in the territories of Attawandaran, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples, and also on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I've been fortunate to work with CELA for about three years now. And for those who might not know us, uh, CELA is a specialty legal clinic within the Ontario-wide network of clinics funded by Legal <sighs> Aid Ontario. And we work to protect human health and the environment um, by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and by working to change policies to present, prevent such problems in the first place. As a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less influence and who receive less of a say in decision making. And I'm so pleased um, to be able to participate in this webinar today and to welcome you to the launch of a new comprehensive guide for Indigenous nations, communities, and non-governmental organizations in Ontario. With thanks to the funding provided by the Law Foundation of Ontario, CELA, with contributions by the Grassy Narrows First Nation Land Protection Team, has created this toolkit which aims to shed light on IPCAs as an emerging legal mechanism for protecting lands and water. As Indigenous-led conservation and IPCAs gain traction both in Canada and around the world, this first-of-its-kind toolkit strives to support the recognition of Indigenous-led conservation efforts, respond to barriers in establishing IPCAs, and model the legal and policy basis needed to advance Indigenous-led governance in the establishment and management of protected areas. We're going to have two speakers today. So first we will hear from Indigenous knowledge holder, land protector and elder, Joseph Fobister, who will share the actions Grassy Narrows First Nation has taken in declaring an Indigenous sovereignty and protected area within their territory. Mr. Fobister was ANA's lead negotiator on forestry matters for over a decade and is currently the ANA land protection team's lead negotiator in crown processes related to lands and waters and in matters advancing crown recognition of the ANA IPCA. In Mr. Fobister's capacity as lead negotiator, he also supervises land protection team staff. He is an avid and highly skilled land user who has witnessed climate change impacts over his decades in the forest and on the water. He cares deeply about the ANA community taking climate change action and better understanding climate change impacts on the community, including through monitoring and assessment activities. Following that, we will hear from project lead and settler lawyer, Carrie Blaze, who brings her experience serving Indigenous community members and leadership in matters of urgent governance and environmental law matters to this project. Carrie's also a member of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, or CRP, which aims to critically investigate the state of conservation practice in Canada and support efforts to advance Indigenous-led conservation in the spirit of reconciliation and decolonization. Carrie will share a summary of this new toolkit, which includes immediate actions Indigenous nations can undertake to start discussion about lands protection and governance, interim measures which may help delay adverse impacts or risks while developing an IPCA, and lasting solutions aimed at achieving long-term protection of Indigenous lands and water. Following their presentations, the session will conclude with a question and answer period. Uh, and I invite you to share any questions you may have in the chat box at any point during the presentation, and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end of our session. So with that, I am pleased to pass the microphone over to Joseph Obister just as soon as I can unmute you. Hang on one moment. If you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. And I will Hi. share the screen in just a moment here. Go ahead. Want to go to slide one? Yeah, I just need, sorry, I should have done this before I pass the mic over to you. Let me just get this up real quick. Of course, now it's going to take its time. It's thinking about it. Okay, and we'll get over to slide one. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi. Thanks for having me. My uh, name is uh, Joseph Fulbister. I'm from uh, Grassy Narrows, also known as Subscrasiwagong. We're uh, 
Ojibwe Nation. Um, <clears throat> we have a community of about a thousand people living on reserve. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, well, I'm proud to be a part of this community. It's, uh, it's very strong on, uh, on uh, land protection. <clears throat> and this includes everybody is pretty much uh, involved in uh, land protection in one way or another. We have elders, youth, uh, and I'm, and I'm very proud of, to say that uh, our chief and council are very uh, strong in their support for uh, land protection, while while other uh, First Nations are uh, making deals, our uh, First First Nation our leadership uh, supports the the action being and protecting the land. You don't see a lot of that in my area. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of First Nations that are, uh, are getting involved in, uh, in uh, contracts, uh, um, logging contracts, mining contracts, and, and whatever. Uh, I think uh, our leadership is right in uh, involving the community and allowing the you know the community to lead uh, this fight against uh, uh, industrial activity. <clears throat> um, we have uh, taken a lot of done a lot of action around uh, land protection. Put on the next, next slide. Uh, if you don't know where grass now is, it's uh, on the map. And, and we're just way north of uh, Kenora and uh, east of Winnipeg. We're almost right at the border. Uh, my community has been here for many hundreds of years. and. Uh, and uh, they've traveled through the, the whole territory. The next slide. Uh, the, the, the area that, that's colored in pink is our territory. Uh, and then, and a lot of that is uh, what's being uh, uh, Called a uh, whiskey jack forest. There's a little portion on the on your right hand side where another First Nation is uh, 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 calls it uh, has it their territory. Next slide. Where people lived on uh, the grass knolls and uh, so they uh, enjoyed hunting and fishing and, and uh, trapping, uh, picking berries, you know, picking medicines. It, it was a good life for uh, for the people of Grassy. Uh, although we had no uh, electricity, no no sewer and water, no no telephones, no TVs, no roads, we were happy. Uh, Next slide. As, as you'll see in the picture, there's uh, often a lot of gatherings at the main, main community. Uh, people did well living over there, that gardens, and, uh, and uh, you know, people lived in uh, you know, family groups. Next slide. Uh, as you'll see here, uh, people lived in uh, family groups are on the top. You'll see uh, uh, a, a couple and their uh, uh, their son and and his wife and their and their grandchildren. And on and on the right 
the bottom right, you'll see uh, people, you know, getting ready to go uh, blueberry picking. So this, this was our this picture was taken at a, a blueberry picking site near uh, near the community. Next slide. Uh, people, you know, went out and uh, you know, enjoyed, you know, the land. People were free to, uh, you know, do what they wanted without, uh, you know, a lot of uh, restrictions, you know, that, that uh, we now have, and uh, the, you know, the husband and wife, you know, worked worked hard to keep uh, uh, the, you know, house uh, going. As you as you see in the bottom, the uh, uh, a lady that. Uh, Cut some wood in the wood in the forest nearby. Heat heat in her home. Next slide. And in, in nineteen between nineteen sixty and nineteen seventy, uh, the the mill in in Dryden uh, was a uh, dumped. Ten tons of mercury into our waterway, and uh, it wasn't discovered until the uh, end, uh, early or towards the end of uh, 1960, 69, 70. And, and that, uh, when that happened, a lot of uh, our people were became unemployed because uh, the Fishing the people relied on uh, fishing, uh, commercial fishing, uh, and guiding. All of a sudden, there was no uh, no employment. Uh, it left people, uh, you know, poor and uh, unemployed. <clears throat> I remember. Uh, some days when I was a kid during that time that uh, we uh, you know we'd go days without uh, having having food because uh, our, our uh, source source of income was uh, suddenly not there anymore. You know, people suffered a lot. Uh, people turned turned to uh, alcoholism, alcohol to uh, to our uh, uh, as a, a way of, uh, I guess, relieving the suffering, of the, all the, that didn't solve anything. Next slide. <clears throat> um, and this slide is a. Uh, I'm going to talk, talk about uh, the, the the devastation that happened. Shortly after the the mercury was discovered, we were now faced with uh, uh, clear cut logging in our territory. Uh, there was absolutely no absolutely no income or no uh, money coming from what was happening up to our land and our, our trap lines. <clears throat> Next slide. You'll see here in the, in the right in the middle somewhere there's a little block, which is uh, a trap line, and uh, this all the red dots you see are uh, are uh, clear cuts uh, that were uh, done over 20 years on on this man's trap line. He, he, tr he tried hard to. Uh, Fight the, you know, the, the government and industry to uh, to uh, leave some land for for uh, you know, for, you know so, so he can hunt and trap. He had attended uh, uh, forest pa forest management planning meetings, to try and, and uh, you know. You know, change the way things were done, but uh, it 
you know, it, his voice was not uh, heard at all. He, he was just, uh, he, uh, as, as he argued, you know, they kept cutting more trees and more you know, trees came down and uh, <clears throat> finally had to, uh, next slide. And this is what happened over uh, several years. You'll see the red dot on the on the map again. Uh, all the destruction that was happening in our territory. Uh, the gray, I, I believe, is uh, mining. My, uh, mining where, where permits were issued. <clears throat> Next slide. So in in uh, two thousand two, after uh, lots of planning and uh, meeting with uh, and and protest with uh, at government offices and uh, in front of the uh, Abitibi Mill in Kenora, we uh, after failing the to be heard, we. Uh, started a blockade. I, I thought at the time that uh, you know, it was a, a foolish idea that uh, was going to be, uh, was, was likely to be dismantled in uh, a very short time. But when the police came, we had been uh, talking to the police and, uh, and uh, media about uh, our planned action to blockade. When, uh, when, the, when, the, when the blockade started, uh, we, we were told that the police were coming. They were going to come and assess the situation. And, and when the police arrived, I, I met with uh, the sergeant I was assigned to, uh, to uh, do the assessment. Uh, we agreed that, uh, that uh, There'd be, there would be no violence. It would be, uh, uh, we would do, you know, things legally. And uh, they, they uh, asked that we uh, give them a daily update on, on, uh, on, e on the events at the blockade. There were several, several people on the first day, it was mainly uh, kids that came. Uh, from the school, the, uh, the, the principal at the time uh, uh, authorized that the classrooms would be uh, done at the blockade. Uh, and instead of learning uh, classroom stuff, they're going to be taught, uh, uh, you know, the land stuff, you know, land you know, protection. That worked out really well, and uh, there were several, just less than several months, just uh, the blocking trucks. Uh, they were sneaking by us using another route, and, uh, or or uh, or uh, you know, going through at uh, two or three in the morning while uh, they thought we were sleeping. We found out about it and started uh, blockading at, at uh, continued to blockade at three or four in the morning. Uh, that went on for a little while, and then uh, eventually they uh, they uh, stopped because uh, the, the route that they the only the only route that they were allowed to take was uh, was taking too long to get to to, to uh, get the wood to the mill. Next slide. <clears throat> you know, there's actions uh, in Toronto and at the legislative building at the on premier's office, and uh, and we had we, we had uh, protests uh, like everywhere, in Montreal, place like that, and even in Seattle. Um, we were successful in uh, uh, garnering the support of uh, environmental groups and uh, 
and it's been, and especially the, this one guy that uh, that I'm thankful for you know, for his support and that's uh, David, my friend. Who, when I when I first met David, he offered his help, and uh, and uh, I was thinking, you know, what can one guy do for uh, you know? And it's just one man. Uh, I, I, I was thinking more, you know, the you know environmental groups like Greenpeace would have more uh, have more power to uh, m make a difference. But but I've been totally amazed with uh, with the support we got from David David Sohn. And uh, <clears throat> when when we uh, first began blockading, we had. Uh, Different people come and go. We, had, uh, we were told that uh, from our elders that uh, that uh, we'd be visited by uh, spirits. Some will be good. Some will be bad. And and it, and, it, and they did. The people came and uh, like different uh, people showed up. They. Uh, Told us that uh, they taught us how to uh, do ceremonies. They did ceremonies for us. They uh, taught us how to feast, and um, there's a lot of different things. And some came to uh, you know, discourage us. And you know, at the beginning, the, I would say too that at the beginning, the community was. Uh, was a little nervous about uh, you know the repercussions that the community could have from uh, the people in Kenora, and uh, that that didn't happen. We uh, skipped on uh, protesting and uh, continued to uh, try and uh, stop logging from happening. Next slide. This is one of the slides from the action that were taken. Next slide. Uh, uh, in, in 2005, at the TB mill, the one we, the, the company we were fighting against, uh, shut down their mill in 2005 permanently, and that was uh, a big. Uh, a big win for us. They uh, said that uh, they had to call because of uh, they made a business decision to uh, move on. There's a lot of bad publicity that uh, went along with uh, I think with, with, with that before the decision was made. <clears throat> Next slide. And there is a Abbot to be mill when it was uh, shortly after it closed. As you'll see, there's no uh, steam coming out of the coming out of the buildings. Yeah. We had uh, we were successful in uh, uh, stopping Abbot to be from uh, doing more destruction from our on our land. Next slide. So these are. And this is an example of the kind of uh, kind of uh, things that happen on our territory, on our trap lines. Uh, when when they said when uh, when industry said that they would uh, protect our values, uh, our, our, our places would be respected. Places that we value would be respected. What ended up was just. Uh, Little dot on the map, or maybe about uh, 100 feet wide, that was uh, considered, you know, uh, preserving our our uh, our, uh, our place of value. Next slide, and uh, and to add to. Uh, the relocation, uh, the 
the commercial fishing and uh, the mercury, we, we uh, the government started is issuing uh, or had been issuing uh, mining permits after we've uh, we had declared a moratorium. Moratorium was was in place on uh, in, in the year two thousand seven. Uh, it was uh, a law that uh, Grassnews had uh, developed, and uh, to some degree the there was a recognition for that uh, for that moratorium, and then following that we uh, declared uh, land declaration banning all industrial activity, including mining, forestry, and and, and other stuff, because we didn't want to. Uh, so much had happened to our to our territory that uh, that uh, our people were suffering from. Uh, Mercury poisoning and uh, and uh, pesticide spraying was uh, a, a big uh, problem. You know they uh, say it's safe to uh, you know to spray uh, it's a chemical on the ground, and they said that uh, it's. Uh, it's not safe to walk on, but you can eat the berries. That's that's uh, the kind of message that uh, we were being given. <clears throat> and uh, recently, we've uh, taken we're taking Ontario court over uh, over uh, issuing nine permits without uh, consultation and without consent. With grass knows people. So that's where we are with that. Next slide. We, we have a, a land protection team. Uh, there are uh, four people that are uh, monitoring the land, uh, doing repairs on the land, uh, uh, you know, report everything at, at, uh, that. that uh, Comes to their attention. Next slide. And they uh, do um, beaver control, uh, uh, make sure the, the road is uh, safe to pass. <clears throat> well, they, they enjoy their work. They, uh, you know, they, they, they clean up uh, garbage from uh, campsites and, and so on. Next slide. And there's more of uh, the boys doing their job. We also have uh, one girl that's on the team. So they all they work very well together. Next slide. Here they are again. Just, uh, they they uh, do uh, they 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 clear trails to uh to have uh, sort of. I mean, you can have access to uh, uh, other parts of the territory. Um, <clears throat> next slide. Here we are again uh, doing a, a, a road repair. Uh, next slide. Here they are again. Next slide. Uh, a vote was, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump back a bit here. Uh, uh, in 2015, the, the community was, uh, was asked, you know, what, what, uh, what is their wish for the forest? You know, and uh, do you want some logging? Or sorry, do you want no logging, small scale logging, medium sized logging, and full scale logging? Uh, and this was uh, paid for by the Ministry of Natural Resources. So the people went 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 uh, to vote on the on these. And next slide. And the result was that. Uh, 
the majority of the people have voted no logging. Uh, I, I uh, tend to uh, to uh, not agree with uh, some of the small scale log, medium log that was voted. I think there, there was some coercion by uh, the the workers at the time to uh, to uh, you know, have people you know vote for logging. But my my, my experience was that. Uh, that uh, ben never, there were never any benefits for grassy from uh, logging. So you know, why why would we let them log if uh, there'd be no benefits for us? And uh, more importantly, it was uh, it was you know damaging our environment. It was uh, clear cuts were uh, were uh, introducing more mercury into the waterway. Everything that, uh, that that gets cut ends up flowing into the the English Owabagoon River, which ends up in our uh, in the lake in, in our lakes in front of us, where we get our water and we get up where we get our fish. Next slide. Uh, recent forest management plans have, uh, as you'll see on the left, is a. Uh, First Nation that uh, has uh, agreed to uh, partake in logging, and you'll see how much uh, how, how much of their, their land is being being cut. It's, uh, that's, I believe that's over a five-year period. That uh, so those, those green dots that, that uh, that's how much wood would be, be taken out of the the First Nations territory, and on the right you'll see uh, grasses. Uh, my my community's uh, map of uh, harvesting. You'll see practically none. We have a uh, First Nation that's uh, living to the east of us that uh, ha has allowed logging, and you'll know, you'll see that. Uh, that uh, that logging is occurring on their land, <clears throat> and uh, I'm very happy that uh, we've been successful. We uh, we are uh, fighting for our treaty rights. We know our rights. We know that uh, that uh, uh, industry cannot happen without our free, prior, and informed consent. We 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 enforce that ourselves. I don't know if a lot of uh, First Nations are aware of that, but you know, uh, First Nations have the power to uh, to uh, limit or stop uh, industrial activity that's happening on their territories. Next slide. I don't know if there's any more. And. Uh, that's pretty much it. I, uh, my friend David is on. I don't know if he uh, can uh, uh, say something or if I've forgotten something. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing those stories. David, did you want to unmute and add anything at this time? I think you covered it all, JB. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well then uh, let's pass the mic over to Carrie as I get the slide decks changed over. Thanks, April. And welcome everyone. It's great to see some familiar names and uh, during the Q&A, you can take your camera off if you like and we'll have a more one-on-one um, -on -one discussion perhaps, but uh, Great, thanks April. So I'm going to pick up um, where Joseph left off in a sense. So Grassy Narrows and the Canadian Environmental Law Association came together with an idea to create a toolkit. Um, 
that sets out a number of the key challenges and barriers to establishing an Indigenous protected and conserved area in Ontario. And so I'm, I'm, I was very grateful to be project lead for this um, multi-month, multi-year actually endeavor and, and to share some of the highlights with you today. Next slide, April. Thanks. So we have just launched uh, the full toolkit. It's about 150 pages and um, it's divided up into three parts. So hopefully it's more tangible and you can digest it in smaller sections if you want to, not all at once. And uh, the report, the toolkit is online on our website. Um, and so again, I'm just gonna provide some, some highlights today. So it's intended to be a public legal resource uh, specific to IPCAs in Ontario and how you might go about establishing one. Um, it's intended for use by First Nations, but also nonprofits who may be working in the lands conservation field um, or allied organizations. And the aim of the toolkit is to help provide some recommendations or some partial solutions on, on overcoming um, the barrier to land protection in a way that, that advances Indigenous justice. Um, and as April shared briefly with you in the introduction, the toolkit provides guidance on both the interim, I'll say like immediate actions that can be taken to protect lands and waters from um, industrial threats of mining and forestry, but it also thinks more longer term, um, you know, about actions which can be taken within a community for, for longer term um, protection. And, and I'll just say that the toolkit is not exhaustive. And if we've left something out, it's not on purpose. Um, it, it's meant to provide a highlight, a high level review of what's going on in Canada that we can use here in Ontario to, to move IPCAs forward. Um, and it's, I, I hope we've captured the incredible amount of advocacy from Indigenous communities um, and efforts to advance IPCAs and um, enable IPC recognition in the province. Next slide. And by way of background, you know, you're maybe you're wondering, well, who who brought this toolkit together? So it um, it was not possible without many many uh, contributions from the Grassy Narrows Lands Protections Team, um, and without the funding from the Law Foundation of Ontario. And so as, as many of you may know, we are a legal aid clinic and our primary funder is Legal Aid Ontario. However, we do rely on external funding for projects such as this to extend our capacity and our ability um, to engage with communities and, and create toolkits that are uh, public legal resources. And, and so we're very, very grateful for the Law Foundation's support um, and, and their um, um, also their flexibility. This project was completed when many of us were in lockdown for the COVID pandemic. And of course that uh, had a number of uh, capacity limitations. And so being able to complete this project virtually remotely um, had new challenges, but we're very pleased to share this with you today. And also there was a number of students from Osgoode Hall Law School from um, uh, the in environmental justice clinic there at Osgoode who also contributed. So th this is kind of a masterpiece, I would say, of um, research contributions, stories, insights, and reflections. Next slide. And so as this toolkit explores, and, and this is probably not a shock to the individuals joining us today or, or watching this later, um, the existing legislative means for establishing a protected area assume a crown led or a crown governed model. And so, and, and we see that right across Canada. So there's, there's 55 different pieces of legislation that can establish a protected area. However, none of these pieces of legislation recognize IPCAs or indigenous governance of protected areas. Within Ontario, there are 520 parks and conservation areas none of those areas are IPCAs, they are crown led, crown governed. And so it's within this tool, um, it's within, within this context that this toolkit came to fruition. And so, you know, if you're reading this toolkit, you're welcome to adapt it, change it, make it your own, um, or maybe some of the chapters will trigger more research questions and you're welcome to reach out to us. Many are technical and complex and will take a lot of time, um, but you're welcome to reach out if, if what you read uh, spurs further questions. Next slide. 
So the toolkit begins with a, a quite a lengthy introduction chapter that sets out, you know, first and foremost, what is an IPCA? And so we start from the basis that by recognizing the long standing relationship of care and responsibility between Indigenous peoples and their territories to IPCAs, um, it's redefining how we um, envision and create protected areas. And this toolkit does adopt the definition of an IPCA that was penned by the Indigenous Circle of Experts in their 2018 report called We Rise Together. And, and I posted that definition here. So essentially an IPCA um, are lands and waters where Indigenous governments have the primary role in protecting and conserving ecosystems through their Indigenous laws, governance and knowledge systems. And throughout this toolkit, we also share stories of um, how the current means of recognizing a protected area has served to foster disconnect between uh, Indigenous nations and their lands. Um, historically, Indigenous peoples were forcefully removed from their lands, which settlers then used uh, in, in many different ways, including to, to designate protected areas. Um, and as the case studies that we've included throughout the toolkit illustrate, um, often um, it's after decades of struggle and years of grassroots action and legal action um, that we're now seeing uh, the beginnings of a transformation of conservation in Ontario. IPCAs have also become a centerpiece of global efforts to safeguard biodiversity and respond to climate change. And it was following the UN, uh, uh, sorry, the UN Convention on Bio Biological Diversity uh, in 2020 that Canada committed to the target one, which requires that at least 17% of terrestrial areas and inland water and 10% of coastal areas be protected. Those numbers have slightly changed. It's now um, an increased target to 25% of protection by 2025. And just yesterday, um, it was announced that the next Convention on Biological Diversity, the, the kind of the, the Paris uh, COP for biodiversity, that is happening in Montreal in December. So this is certainly a timely discussion. And, and with that convention coming up in December, um, there, there are new opportunities uh, for advocacy and, and further um, efforts to advance IPCAs here in Ontario and throughout the country. In the introduction chapter of our toolkit, we also set out that in using the, the label IPCA, um, we have to recognize that IPCAs are, are distinct and they're diverse. There is not a cookie cutter one size fits all. Even the names um, vary if you look at how IPCAs are named on, on a global context. And so, so we do go through that within the toolkit. And what we try to show is that what unites an, an IPCA, generally speaking, are, are these co three core principles, which we've noted on this slide. And so the first principle is that an IPCA is Indigenous led and governed meaning the Indigenous nation has the primary role in that protected area's um, uh, oversight and how those lands are, are, are used or managed. Um, and other stakeholders, such as government, uh, are, are collaborators, let's say, or partners. But the primary role is the Indigenous um, nation. Principle two, uh, which is a commitment to long-term conservation for many, in, um, for many generations, again is this orientation that the protected area have a positive contribution to conservation of nature um, and livelihoods and community well-beings in such a way that it's connected to the, to the health of both the lands and, and the communities uh, for, for generations to come. The third principle um, is that, it, that the IPCA elevate Indigenous rights and responsibilities. And so this means that the Indigenous governments have the authorities to, to govern their lands and waters, including the cultural and, and sacred sites that might be within those um, boundaries. And, and put simply, you cannot have a protected area labeled an IPCA if you don't have these three core principles uh, reflected in the agreements or the implementation of, of that um, protected area. And within the toolkit, we also set out um, some principles around ethical space and knowledge systems and, and how, um, you know, when you have multiple legal traditions, Crown and Indigenous, how those interact. And, and also we start from the preface that 
um, neither legal order order has has more weight or more legit more legitimacy than the other. And so there's a lot of new terms, perhaps for some people that are used in the toolkit. So we do have a glossary as well to try and unpack what is meant by decolonize, what is meant by land back, how does that play into IPCAs, um, and and how does that move the conversation forward. Next slide. So in advocating for the establishment of IPCAs, um, Indigenous communities have faced uh, si significant, to say the least, um, barriers to um, protecting areas of land. And, you know, we know there's a lack within our legislative framework. There is no law where there's a neat fit where this can easily move forward. Um, and then also it does remain a crown led and a crown based uh, model. And so given this continued lack of recognition and respect for Indigenous laws, um, it, it often means that when an IPCA is, is designated as such by a First Nation, it is not respected per se because it hasn't been incorporated or recognized by the dominant legal jurisdiction. And so what this means in practice is that if, let's say, a moratorium is declared on forestry, on mining, on new developments um, within a specific territory, uh, by virtue of not being included in, in the more dominant legal system, those moratoriums that are declared by the, the First Nation will not or are not respected. And so we're very aware of that challenge. And so what we've tried to do is set out um, a range of, the, of, of legal options where an IPCA can be established to try and combat um, this existing uh, legislative lacuna. And so if we think about IPCAs as existing along a spectrum, and so we can call it a jurisdictional spectrum, you know, we have, you know, the crown based parks on one side, which is, you know, your conventional Ontario parks and your national parks. And then the other side of the spectrum, you have those that are um, established based solely on Indigenous authority. And then there's that, that middle ground where you have protected areas that are agreed to uh, and, and governed on a, a co-governance model. And so this flows, this kind of jurisdictional spectrum approach to IPCAs, it, this also flows from the um, Indigenous Circle of Experts report, where they recommended that as a priority, governments should be recognizing Indigenous legal orders uh, and governance authorities for IPCAs. And then second, governments should be creating a distinct category of protected areas within existing legal structures. And then third, um, you know, creating uh, a model for this more joint decision making um, approach. Next slide. So those are all the, not all actually, that's some of what we cover in the introductory chapter of the toolkit. And then moving into part one, what we do is we've divided it by, um, you know, immediate actions, interim actions, and then long term. So part one is the immediate things. So if a community is thinking about uh, developing or establishing an IPCA, where do you begin? And so we have um, tried to synthesize um, the materials that currently exist on how a First Nation can um, create the vision for an IPCA, let's say. And so, you know, this might be having conversations with community members and elders and knowledge holders who, who can share their vision and hopes for an IPCA within their territory. And then, you know, in the earliest of days, defining the spatial region. And this is not to prove the existence that this Indigenous nation existed on these lands, but rather to inform decision makers um, of, of the Indigenous laws and practices um, that must be respected and, and reconciled, uh, because if that does not occur, then it will be incompatible with the purposes uh, that we reviewed for, the, for an IPCA. Um, and then currently one of the main challenges, it, again, is that IPCAs um, may not be recognized by the federal or the provincial government. And so you get this conflict in land use and regulatory processes, again, because the crown-based process has been deemed uh, dominant. We also, in part one, share um, examples and, and, and resources where IPCAs in Canada have utilized um, international registries where you can actually register an IPCA or, or register uh, an, a, 
a moratorium declaration, let's say. Uh, and, and so that will be uploaded to an international registry, both of which are, are overseen by the United Nations. And even if the province or Canada hasn't formally recognized the IPCA, it is one means that, that a community can use to, to elevate um, um, the recognition of uh, their Indigenous protected and conserved areas. And then within part one, we also identify, you know, what are the threats? Like if you're thinking about establishing an IPCA early, early days, what are the internal threats, let's say, um, to capacity within, within a community? And so for, for many um, Indigenous communities, there are pre-existing threats and crises that continue to um, limit the capacity of a community to, to put time and effort and thought into these projects. Um, and, and so how, how would that impact the capacity to, to see this out in the long term um, when there are pre-existing challenges from, from drinking water to housing shortages to um, uh, health crises? And then there's external threats to um, proposing an IPCA as well. And so, you know, while a community may be engaged in, dis in discussions about protecting lands and protecting territory, uh, how do the more immediate threats from, let's say, industrial logging or mining exploration, how does that actually curtail the openness of those um, community discussions that could be happening around, you know, protecting lands and waters? Uh, next slide. And what we also offer in the toolkit is um, examples of, of communities who are uh, in the process or have established an IPCA and how they got there and how they did it and kind of the bumps and hurdles and, and lessons learned along the way. And so um, it, throughout the toolkit, we try to pair the theoretical, I'll say, with the tangible and, and examples of, of where this is being done. If it's not in Ontario, then where in Canada can you look to uh, for some guidance and for some inspiration? Next slide. Thanks. So part two is maybe the the most legalistic, I'll say, uh, section of the toolkit. So we look at um, what are the interim protection measures for establishing, you know, before you've actually established an IPCA. So uh, how do you go about withdrawing lands from mining claims and exploration? How do you, um, within a forest management process, let's say, withdraw certain areas and they'd be very limited uh, from logging or harvesting? So what do you do in the interim um, to actually protect territory before an IPCA, let's say, is established. And so in part two, we review these interim protection measures. Um, for each of the interim protection measures we review, they are not individually um, good enough alone. Uh, it, it definitely takes a comprehensive, if not all, of the measures we propose to, to make a dent in actually um, uh, protecting land in the interim. And, and often these legal tools are used in tandem with significant social justice advocacy um, and, and um, campaigning efforts. So I, I don't wanna paint this as a purely legal solution when it's not, um, it's only part of, of the bigger picture. Um, next slide. And in part three, we propose the long-term um, solutions to actually establishing an IPCA and, and the frameworks and the pathways that that can, can come to fruition. And so um, the starting point for this chapter, again, is this recognition that historically Indigenous peoples have been removed from their lands and territory to make way for protected areas. And so we cannot um, move forward and talk about conservation and lands protection without recognizing um, this basis to, you know, the, the protected lands um, conversation. And so when historically First Nations were cleared from the land for recreational and, and tourist purposes, now um, we're trying to change that conversation by first recognizing these historical wrongs and how any conversation about lands protection must be trauma informed. And by that, I mean, um, you must, if you're an NGO or a settler like myself, or you find yourself to be an, an ally of a First Nation who is working to advance IPCAs, we, we cannot um, talk about lands protection uh, separated or, or somehow independent from, from the, the colonial history that brought us to this point um, today. And in part three, what we also do is go in, in actually quite great detail about uh, the jurisdictional spectrum of how you establish an IPCA based on indigenous 
authority solely. Um, then we look at examples of joint Indigenous Crown and established IPCAs. And then we look at parks that currently exist where there's maybe a co-management agreement in place with the neighboring First Nation community. And so how could um, existing Crown-based uh, parks, let's say in Ontario, move towards an IPCA model? Next slide. And again, we provide um, case studies of, of where this is, is occurring um, and some examples. And so there is a lot of reading material um, based on kind of what speaks to you. So if, if a certain model or a certain approach uh, is of more interest, then we do have um, case studies to accompany that. And then lastly, next slide, we briefly touch on um, you know, a final aspect that cannot be overlooked, which is the need for provincial and federal governments to work with Indigenous nations to actually develop um, IPCA legislation or, or as an interim measure, amend existing uh, protected areas legislation so that there is this space for Indigenous-led uh, con conservation. Um, we propose some ways this could happen, but I feel like this was the final chapter in the toolkit and it's kind of more forward looking as to future uh, conversations we could have. Um, with that, next slide. I know we've taken almost the hour today, but we do welcome any questions or um, as you peruse the toolkit, I'll share the link in the chat box. But if you have questions, you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, this is meant to be a, an introduction and not, not, a, not the final end of the conversation. So thank you all for being here today. Back to you, April. Thanks so much, Carrie. All right, so at this point, I would welcome if, uh, Joseph, if you want to unmute yourself, Carrie, if you want to stay unmuted, um, in case questions come up that you would like to answer. So I haven't seen any questions come into the chat box yet, um, which may just be because people were listening carefully instead of crafting questions. Um, so I would ask if people have questions, pop them in the chat. Um, we can also do the little digital hands up thing, or if you have a burning question and you'd like to unmute yourself, you can do that as well. Maybe while we're giving people a moment to think about their questions. Um, yes, perfect. Carrie, I was just going to say, do you want to talk for a second about the web page um, and what people can find on that web page? Great. Thanks, April. Um, so on the web page, what we have done, if you're able to click the link in the chat box for those who are here, um, we've compiled all the resources uh, into parts. So, so instead of reading the toolkit in full, you can focus on, you know, the immediate, the interim, the long-term protection actions. Um, and then we've also included, again, there's some awesome communities and, and organizations who are also working on IPCAs. And so we have quite a list on our website of related resources, be it blogs or, or webinars. So if you, if you do want to um, check out what other um, discussions that are happening on this topic. Again, it's a very interrelated um, field. Uh, we're not doing this in isolation of others. And, and so I think it's important to flag, you know, wh where else are these conversations um, happening? So we try to create a, a collection on our website so you can um, review those materials and uh, always give us feedback. Perfect. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so we have a question in the chat that asks, I was wondering if First Nations might be able to establish an IPCA by passing a bylaw under the Indian Act. Thanks so much, Petri. That's an excellent question. And so what we do, I'll actually deflect that question. I'm, I'll say check out part three of the toolkit. We um, go through the, the kind of the, the legal authority bases for an IPCA, be it you know, a crown-based law like the Indian Act or, or an Indigenous uh, uh, law um, subject to their own rights to self-determination and, and sovereignty. So a very short answer, but yeah, we can definitely connect about, about that one down the road. And Carrie, I'm sorry, I may have missed if you already said this to the group that recognizing it is one o'clock. So if people need to step off, um, completely understand that. Um, there, there's at least one more question in the chat, so we're happy to hang out. Um, hang around and answer that. And if people would like to stay on the line and ask a couple of questions, we can hang out for a little bit longer. So the next question that I see in the chat is, are there any examples of an aquatic conservation area that is First Nations led? And then a follow up is what advice would you have in terms of overlapping interest between First Nations? Thanks, April. 
Joseph, I welcome your thoughts on this one too. So I guess all these letters are in there. I can take a first run at it, then I'll, I can pass it over. Um, oh, except for the S. So that's a, a great question. Thanks, Randy. Oh, yeah, and no S. So there is actually one example we profile in the toolkit, which is a marine protected area that's proposed uh, by Meshkegawik Tribal Council. And so in that instance, it is more comprehensive because it is the, the tribal council working as a representative of multiple First Nations. Um, but at the end of the day, that one, the it would be a proposed marine protected area um, in James Bay. At this stage, um, it is with Mishkegawik, but down the road, it would need the individual uh, First Nations to, to sign on or be on board as well. And so that one might provide some um, guidance as an example of where there's been like an aquatic recognition. Um, but often, maybe Joseph can speak to this too, but often the, the IPCA will include both lands and waters within its scope. And so, um, that that may be an option as well, rather than just choosing one or, or the other. Joseph, did you want to add anything on that? No, question? I got nothing to add to that. No. Okay, no problem. All right, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, did anyone else who's on the line have a question? Want to unmute and ask a question? give people a minute just in case they're having trouble finding their unmute buttons, but I'm not hearing anyone chime in. All right. Well, given that uh, it is 103, I will say, uh, and I, I should just note seeing a number of thank yous popping up into the chat for both of you. Um, so I will echo that and say thank you so much um, to Carrie and to Joseph um, Falbister and my Thanks for involving me in this webinar. I mean, this is uh, this has been so interesting to me to hear all of this. Um, so I will say thank you so much, and please check out the website. Stay in touch.